anyone anywhere who is affected by the virus is certainly a cause of concern for everyone everywhere. And with that basic understanding, it doesn't matter whether you're from the North or South, white or black. Uh, it, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, if you are regular or irregular. If you are a human being, the chances are that you may be affected by this virus if you're exposed to it. That also means that there is a reason for us to look at this conversation in the context of irregular migration as well, um, which has also come to the fore now. A few countries in the Gulf also announcing amnesties. We see a lot of return migrant workers, um, a return of migrant workers and their reintegration. What does this mean? Uh, India, for instance, has now uh, embarked on a journey of perhaps the largest evacuation that the world has ever seen of its migrant workers back to the country uh, through a mission called the Vande Bharat mission. Um, this is in the case of India. We hear similar uh, perspectives from Sri Lanka, from Nepal, who are also planning on evacuating their migrant workers in phased and procedural manners. So we will see that happening. And when they come back, they're coming back to their countries where they already we see job losses in cases of countries in South Asia, massive job losses. And we will see these people now adding to the pressures. So what kind of reintegration policies do we have in mind as we go forward? And, and what is happening in Bangladesh? And the affected today is uh, around 39,000 and died like 550. And I understand this is in fact, uh, we, we don't know actually if this is underreported or overreported. Uh, but I, I'm coming to that point, but, uh, and the test has been done that uh, is performed on around 260,000. And you understand that it's actually extremely low as compared to the number of population, like 160 million populations are only done on the one 260,000 is, is really unthinkable. And this, this has happened primarily because until mid-March, the government has not paid any heat to what is happening around the world. Primarily, government has been busy with something else, and the, some statements came from the from the policymakers. Like one of our ministers said that it's a virus. This virus is nothing but some kind kind of sneezing, some kind of cough, so we don't have to worry about it. And some ministers said that we are more we are stronger than the virus. We don't have to worry. That has, that has sent a signal to the citizens that you can just go around, you can just hang around. So it, it, has, it has been taken so lightly. So this has become now so, uh, how to say, so, so grave is the situation now. And the thousands now, and, and what happens again, until mid-March, those who arrived from the Gulf or somewhere else, and they were just kind of kept confined in one building close to the airport for a few days, and they, they started agitating and they were set free. And they just, uh, they just left the uh, capital city by train, by buses, by launches or whatever, or whatever they, 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 however they, uh, uh, they, 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 they made it, they did it. That means the damage actually has been done. So please remember return migrants is a part of the Gulf migrant. They have to go and come. It's like a migration cycle, free departure, Departure, leave there and come back. Even the immigration bill, not even a single word about return migration. What are we talking in 2020 in the immigration bill? Not even a single word talked about return migration. You have to go, you have to come back. They are not going to die there. They are not going to get the green card. They are not going to get PR. They have to come back. We should have a strong policy for return migration. I think COVID is bringing that. I think that's something very important. But then you cannot put all return migration in one pocket. We have to divide them into three categories. What I call them in Kerala policy advice, at least 30% of them who are normal return. Is it COVID or is it global crisis or is it Gulf War? Is it Nidakat? There are people always return. There is a return. It's not like, because I, was, I talked to some people in Kerala many times. I have seen parents, grandparent was in the Gulf, parent was in the Gulf. I'm seeing now children in the Gulf. There are three generations of Gulf migrants. So, and they go to five countries. I talked to many people. They said, I was in the Gulf for 15 years. Where were you? Three years in Dubai, three years in Qatar, two years in, you know, Bagarin. So, return is normal. So, 30% will come, but they come with some money, some saving. They are not going to beg the government, but they need some policy advice. 
where to invest. So governments should talk about them to provide them opportunities for investment. The second group of people, what I call them, is remigration. All returnees not going to stay in India, not in Sri Lanka or Bangladesh. Remigration, we should talk about that. What is India is doing with Skill India project? We are spending crores of money on Skill India. What are we doing with them? We have to give them extra skill so that they can go back. 30% of them will go back. I have started a big unemployment rate in Nepal. And then we are out of this uh, 1 million um, Nepalese in Gulf. We are expecting, and then I am um, uh, doing some kind of uh, modeling, and I am expecting that 25% uh, of uh, 1 million will return to uh, Nepal. And the uh, large uh, challenge that it remains to us is uh, how to um, uh, reintegrate them, how to uh, keep them in, uh, in isolation or quarantine, or, or how to uh, take them back uh, to their respective villages and how to uh, provide them employment in, in Nepal. So this is the a large um, discussion going on in Nepal. Thus, uh, we think in Nepal we have large impact on unemployment uh, sector and uh, later on uh, food grain. And that's what uh, we are working on it, on it, but this is unexpected. Uh, so we were not, uh, Nepal was not uh, prepared for it. So that is the um, big problem in Nepal, but however, some strategies are being made. So we hope that uh, we can receive these uh, migrant workers uh, from a Gulf country and uh, we can, um, uh, we can uh, manage uh, these people uh, who are uh, returning from uh, Gulf. With the occurrence of the COVID pandemic, those in an irregular status will pay, face a specially risky and difficult future. At least five reasons will account for that. First of all, irregular workers would find it harder to hide from the authorities like they did before. And in a book that we published in 2017, uh, we had looked at all the countries of the uh, the Gulf and and uh, the South South Asia, and recorded many such instances. Um, so they would find it harder to hide. Second, the network that supported and protected them will find it too risky to continue such support. Third, tracing of COVID contacts may reveal migrants who might have been sheltered by friends and relatives earlier. So they are not going to be willing to, willing or perhaps able to do that anymore. Four, sponsors who may have earlier provided a certain degree of facilitation and protection would be less likely to be willing to do so. It's going to be much riskier for them. Finally, the cordoning off and searches of high risk areas seems to have added to this process already because there are areas in Kuwait that I'm told by my friends there that have been sealed off and there are raids of buildings. Uh, and therefore, uh, anyone in an irregular capacity, is, it's going to be really impossible for them to hide. There have been a huge demand for migrant workers of Sri Lankan origin to come back. So now, as we all know, there were different types of migrant workers who are wanting to come back during this context. Some were who had already finished their contract and they were anyway planning to come, but then there were another segment of migrants who were affected by this pandemic, the COVID-19, and wanting to come back. Some were laid off, some were underemployed or feared getting um, un unemployed soon. And then also there was a segment of uh, migrant workers who were panic-stricken. They had a secure job, but they just wanted to come back. They just want to come back. So, but something that um, migrants wanting to return have to take into context is the situation in the country in Sri Lanka also. So now Sri Lanka has have had a lockdown for about two months and there's a lot of unemployment in the country as it is. So those who are coming will face a country that is su suffering economically right now. So the projections show that uh, Sri Lanka will contract by about, uh, World Bank says 
early estimates of the World Bank say that we will contract by about 0.5%, but uh, other estimates say we might contract between 1% to 3%. So the economy is not going to look good in 2020. So those coming back to Sri Lanka from the Middle East, migrant workers will be hit hard in the local labor market as well, just like in the rest of the South Asian countries. Now, in terms of remittances also, we have the latest numbers. Um, if you look at monthly remittances, March is a traditionally high remitting month for Sri Lanka because it's right before the Singhala and Tamil New Year festival, which falls in April. So people normally send a lot of money in, in March. But unfortunately, in 2020, the remittances uh, in March contracted by 14% compared to the previous year, mainly because even though migrant workers had money in hand, they were not able to remit because of the lockdown situation in the Middle East. So I want to ask two specific questions. Why do these migrants resist, you know, all these repatriation schemes? And what are the domestic and foreign policy implications, you know, for the Philippine state? Now, there are three things I want to look at here. The similarities of Philippine South Asia, the differences and the potential interventions that are necessary to understand this dynamic. So Philippines, it's been touted as sort of a key best practice for a lot of sending states for a long time. But the COVID experience has really tested its ability to protect you know, and in fact, the experiences of the Philippines is not very, very different from a lot of these South Asian countries. In fact, we've survived a lot of crises in the past. Libyan conflict in 2014, Iraq 2003, Kuwait 1990s, and Lebanon as well. Now, with COVID-19, it did deepen and expose power asymmetries and capacities of sending countries like the Philippines and South Asian countries to react in a mig crisis migration context. Now, what are the similarities? Well, as you said, um, the high proportion of vulnerable migrants, displaced, stranded, uh, those irregular migrants, uh, irregular migrants with irregular children, aging migrants, migrants with disabilities, et cetera. Low fiscal budget between Philippines and South Asian countries, massive institutional and political pressures, especially within these diplomatic missions. It's a real test of political legitimacy for sending countries. Population constraints, both local and abroad, you know, migrants were seen as liabilities before, uh, assets before, now they're turning into liabilities from a state perspective. The internal and sort of international migrants, the drop in remittances and the demonization of migrant narratives. Now all these similarities, you know, with certain variances, they actually tell you two things. One, that the sending countries need to integrate a crisis context more vigorously in their migration governance in the long run. And the second thing is that they need to holistically integrate you know, local and foreign policy institutions, you know, to better prepare themselves in these crisis contexts. Now, I think that the, the pandemic conditions have really shifted some of the fundamental gravity of the urban, right? Our togetherness, our consolidation, our conglomeration in the urban milieu, this has been changed. That proximity is suddenly dangerous, right? And I think it's important to keep that in mind because in the Gulf, especially, so many of the projects that migrants are there to work on are urban projects, right? And so the, the entire sort of foundational logic of, of urbanism, I think has been called into question at least momentarily by the presence of this global pandemic. And who knows how that will affect the opportunities for migration but it's certainly something that I'm keeping an eye on. Fourth, any of us who've ever spent time sort of looking at the situation of migrants in the Gulf states is aware that there is an enclaving and a segregation in the urban space of the Gulf that's very common. Migrants, labor camps, and migrants are usually situated in particular places. I think that we need to look at the spatial politics present in the cities of the Gulf. That's a, a, a problem. That is certainly that kind of segregation seems extremely problematic, but it's also, I think we need to recognize it as a tool, right? By which states are seeking to combat the spread of this virus and it's a dangerous tool. And I think I am very curious as to how the Gulf states and the cities are going to be navigating the use of this tool in ways that are attentive to the rights and the lives of the migrants who live in these zones, in these districts, and in these spaces.